I'd like to welcome everybody to the Zoom presentation for today. Uh, it's Tuesday, the 21st of April, and I am very happy to be joined today uh, by my counterpart up in Lamar County, Mr. Ross Overstreet. Uh, Ross has done a fantastic job with presentations uh, related to lawns uh, for me in the past. And truth be told, uh, when I have a question about lawns that I don't know the answer to, uh, Ross is my go-to guy. He's going to uh, really has a lot of experience and a lot of expertise to share with you. Uh, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn over the presentation to him. Uh, and I really appreciate him taking the time out of his busy schedule to uh, be with us today and share the benefit of his knowledge. You should be. There we go. Talk now. There we go. All right. Well, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Dr. Stevenson, for inviting me here today. Um, I don't know about the expertise. Uh, I guess if I have something quite like that, uh, I guess you could call it, it would be in turf. Um, but I do appreciate everybody being here today. Um, hopefully you all will enjoy this, get a little bit of something out of it. Um, glad to kind of tag along here on Christian's uh, Zoom meetings and add a topic that usually pretty pretty popular because most all of us have a lawn that we're, we're taken care of and worried about and especially now that we have a little bit more free time, a lot of us are getting out and noticing some things that we may may try to improve or try to change and do a little differently. So um, today I just kind of want to talk a little bit about establishing and maybe some identification of turf grasses and just some basic care. Um, this will be a kind of an ongoing series. I hopefully uh, Christian will let me kind of take a, day a week or every two weeks, however we get it worked out. We'll plan that a little bit later, but uh, as of right now, it'll be one day a week. I'll try to jump on here and we'll look, delve into a subtopic of a loan situation or a loan problem, I guess you could say, whether it be weed control, disease ID, um, and control or cultural practices, anything like that, insects, that kind of stuff. So. Today we're just going to talk about the basis of lawn care, which is basically identifying what type of grass you have. Um, and if you don't have a type of grass or if you have multiple types of grass, kind of selecting the, the variety or the species that it works best in your situation. Um, so we're not going to go deep into the individual issues today, but we will get into those as, um, as, the, time, as the presentations proceed. So, Again, thank you all for being here. Um, now I'm going to get into my actual presentation here, I believe, if I can. Um, let's see here. So, see how this starts. All right, hopefully you all are seeing the beginning of my slideshow here. Um, so, shared my screen, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, the objectives for today are gonna to be basically select the best turf species for each situation, whether that be your lawn or whether it be uh, if you're creating maybe a little putting green or something in your backyard or whatever it may be you're trying to do. Uh, first thing you need to do is figure out what the situation is that you're trying to grow the grass. So. Uh, for each each situation, there may be a different species or a different variety that works best for you um, in that particular instance. Um, so understanding characteristics of each of these grasses is going to be key to having us being successful with them. Uh, obviously, you wanna, don't want to plant a grass in a full shade um, that likes full sun, uh, which most grasses do require some type of sun. So um, at least four hours of daylight typically. So uh, filtered sun does count, but again, all turf species are gonna require some sun. So um, in areas where under a big live oak tree or something like that, obviously it's not the best situation for grass. It will grow. There are some things you may need to do to encourage it and 
But in those instances, typically I recommend either putting a planted bed or a um, some type of ground cover um, in those situations. So the first step, obviously, soil test. Um, you want to do this before you establish a yard. Um, that way you can make sure all of your nutrients and your soil is in the best shape as far as the nutrient capacity and uh, the nutrient load as well as the pH uh, is right for the species that you're planning to grow. Um, there is no bad time to sample, um, you know, but you want to be consistent. Um, you know, we recommend testing every three years, but if you're establishing or you're having issues, you may want to test a little more often just to monitor any changes and to see what practices you have done and how those have influenced your soil. So uh, it may be a good idea to do it a little more often than, than the three years that we, than we recommend. So, so some things you need to talk about or think about when you're selecting which grass species. Um, I know a lot of us already have the grass species, but a lot of times that may not be the correct species that works best in the particular area, and that may be one we're having issues. So some th questions you have to ask, how much shade do you have? How much work do you want to put into it? Um, you know, it, some grasses obviously like on a golf course or a sports field, they're out there mowing every day. Um, obviously you don't want to do that as a homeowner. Uh, I wouldn't think, um, you may, some people might, but uh, I know I don't. Um, but uh, how much do you plan to invest? Obviously, we can just let, kind of my, my mantra is if it's green, it's good. Um, so I used to be all about the yard and now I'm just kind of to the point where, you know, you put as much into it as you want or you can put as little and, you know, it depends on what your goals are. You want to be yard of the month or you just want to have something that's green out there? Um, and how do you plan to use the lawn? That's a pretty important question um, as far as which species you select. Obviously, you know, if you're not out there very often and not going to have a lot of traffic on it, like a playground set or something for your kids or grandkids, something like that, you know, that, that higher traffic is going to require, probably won't you require a little bit different species of perf to be grown just so it can handle the traffic. So today we're going to be looking at warm season grasses. The way we're I'm talking about today, we're not going to be talking about cool season grasses. This is typically for South Mississippi is what we're looking at pretty much, but most of these varieties will grow throughout Mississippi. Uh, even some of those, some of you up north um, that I know Christian said uh, were joining us. Glad to have y'all. Uh, but a lot of these species are going to overlap. This is maybe St. Augustine may not be an option for you up there. Um, but, you know, all of these will still be relevant and still be uh, possible up there um, in the north end of the state. Uh, but the warm season grasses are what we're going to focus on, obviously. We're in the warm season right now. We're kind of in the transition time from cool season to warm season. Um, but we're going to be mostly looking at Bermuda grass, zoysia, centipede, St. Augustine, carpet grass, and bahia. Um, those first six are the ones we're going to be talking more about today than any of them. Seashore paspalum is not something you'll probably run into, and buffalo grass is something I've never even seen myself, but it is an option. Um, and then we're not even gonna get into the cool season grasses. These are mostly used for forages or uh, in sports turf, sports fields, those kind of things, golf courses for color during the winter year, winter time. Um, so they're not really recommended for lawns, permanent lawns in South Mississippi or North Mississippi for that matter. Um, but, you know, if you do look, are looking for something to plant during the winter time. If you'd like, we don't, I don't recommend it uh, just because you're introducing a weed species into your turf, another competitor that's gonna take the nutrients and the shade and, or the sun and the water from your permanent grass. So this is something that you'll wanna contemplate. So I know a lot of people would like, would like to have that pretty green grass and stick out from their neighbors in the winter time, but me, it's just not worth the work, and you're being a detriment to your to your permanent stand of 
uh, of lawn. So it's not something that I recommend doing for homeowners. So most all of our warm season grasses, which are those six I mentioned, are stoloniferous. Uh, they have a running growth habit. So stolons are the plant structures that creep across the top of the ground. Uh, those are what you see growing across your flower bed, top of your mulch, or across your curbs or sidewalks and driveways, those kind of things. That is what a stolon is. And then the rhizome is basically the kind of the mirror image of that structure, but underground. So those are the ways that the plant reproduces and spreads. Uh, not Maybe not reproduces, but that's the way it spreads. Um, the ideal growth temperatures are 75 to 95, which is what we're having now. So that's why a lot of our lawns are coming out of dormancy now. Um, that we've been coming out of probably about the past two months, slowly but surely. Um, they do have a winter dormancy period, as we're all aware of. It's not necessarily saying they're dead. They're not dead during that time. They still need water. They're still photosynthesizing to an to a to a degree, but they're they're basically just sitting there waiting on the right conditions to kind of come back around. Most of our warm season grasses have limited seeded cultivars, so a lot of these you're going to either need to put out side seed or sod or plugs or sprig them. So there are some seeded cultivars like centipede, uh, centiseed, and uh, there are some Bermuda grass seeds that are available that are that are very well suited for a lawn. So those are some good options and they're a little bit cheaper and just a little more time consuming than a side obviously or a sprig, but they, they do work. Um, and obviously they're ideally suited for Mississippi summer climates because of that 75 to 95. So the first one we're gonna start with is Bermuda grass. Uh, this one is probably one of the more widely used home lawn varieties in Mississippi. Uh, it is definitely one of the widest used in sports fields and golf courses. It handles traffic very well. It has a kind of a fine texture. It is, it grows fast, but it, it, it's a good carpet grass. It looks good. It, it, it requires a lot of nutrients, a lot of water for the most part. Um, but it can be managed very easily. A lot of herbicides can be used on it. A lot of insecticides, it does have some insect pressure as far as fall army worms and some other things. But um, for the most part, it's a, it's a very good grass. It's, it's a good barefoot grass. It's comfortable to walk on, barefooted, and um, it, it provides a very, very good lawn when well maintained, when well managed. So you can see here the seed head kind of looks like up here in the top right hand corner, kind of just like a little crow's foot, um, kind of a, just a little front splay of seed along the axis there. You can kind of see some in that bottom picture as well. Uh, that's, but this rise or this stolen that you see in this top right hand picture is very indicative of Bermuda grass. That's what you'll see creeping across your sidewalks or into your flower beds. Um, and it does have both stolons and rhizomes. So that's what makes this such a big, big grass used in sports fields and um, golf courses, just because it has that good uh, recovery. Um, so when they play a football game or we've got kids or something that run out there and like to play or uh, that kind of stuff, dogs, animals, that kind of stuff, you know, they, it'll re recover pretty quick. Uh, during the growing season. So it does have good drought tolerance. It does, it will, you know, under extreme drought, it will go dormant, kind of like a winter dormancy. It'll shut down, kind of turn brown. And then when we get the rain again or get some moisture, it will, it'll green back up. So uh, it does have a good survival instinct built into it. Um, it is very fast establishment. Uh, just because of that same reason, there are vegetative, vegetatively propagated types. There are common types which are seeded, which can be seeded. The vegetative types have to be sprigged or put down a sod or plugged. Uh, there, you can't buy the vegetative or the hybrids or um, 
are sterile, so they don't produce a viable seed. Uh, and then there are some seeded hybrids that are available, and these are the ones that will make a good home lawn uh, situation. So the downside to Bermuda grass, poor, poor shade tolerance. Um, this thing, the more sun you give it, the better it's gonna do. Um, it, it doesn't like hardly any shade. There are a couple of new, newer varieties out um, that do a little bit better with the shade, um, but they're still not good. Uh, better does not mean good at all, but um, they're high maintenance. They like a lot of good bit of water, good bit of fertilization. You need to keep them mowed pretty regularly to to keep it tight and to keep it um, keep it kind of from getting stemmy and leggy looking. It, it'll it'll turn kind of wild on you pretty quick, and then once you mow it down, it'll kind of look look bad. But um, it does have some very good characteristics. So that's just something to think about. Our next one is going to be centipede grass. This one is probably one of my favorite grasses currently, just because of its low maintenance and low um, low upkeep. So it has the lowest overall maintenance needs of any of our species that we can grow. Um, typically, you don't have to fertilize it, but maybe once a year in the spring, and um, you know you could get away with the light application later in the summer typically you don't want to most of all of your fertility requirements for centipede can be um, can be acquired just from returning the clippings and mulching the the clippings back into the yard so don't bag up your clippings and take put them in a garbage bag and set them out by the road you're basically just throwing away fertilizer so obviously if you let it get you know if you're mowing hay out there you don't want the hay to sit on your grass and uh, shade out and kill, possibly kill and cause some issues. But you know, typically, if you're doing, if you're mowing your at a consistent time and interval, um, you shouldn't have an issue with shade or with uh, with the clipping issue. So it's got pretty decent shade tolerance. So this is one that you'll you can kind of grow underneath some some trees if you can kind of prune out your trees and keep them kind of you know kind of some filtered sun coming through there. Um, so it is a good option. Uh, it can be established by seed, as I mentioned earlier. Some of the seed can be very expensive. Uh, you're looking at about $35 to $40, $30 to $40 per pound of seed. So um, seed can be relatively expensive. Um, there are, it does have a naturally kind of yellowish green color. It don't have that dark green color like a Bermuda grass does. So, you know, that can be a downside to it to a lot of people. Um, a lot of people just want that dark, rich green color instead of that yellowish green. But, and it doesn't also, also doesn't have very good traffic tolerance. So it doesn't like, you know, it, this is, that's why it's not on football fields and that kind of stuff, because it just takes so long to recover from injury or, um, you know, from, from some type of practice like that cultivation. So, and the reason for that, it doesn't produce the underground rhizomes. It only produces the stolons. So this is what a stolen, or this is a stolen and a long and centipede grass. You can see it is a very, um, you know, kind of a lighter green color. The seed head is obviously just kind of a stalk. Um, it's probably through three to five inches tall. Um, so it's not very big, even at the full grown stage. That's why I like this is you can, this particular variety or this particular species is because you can kind of let it go, uh, kind of, if you, if it gets wet or something outside and you miss a mowing one week or every 10 days or so, you're not out there mowing hay the next time you get a chance to get out there and mow it. Clips easily. Um, so you can see the stolen on this in the top picture. Um, the It does have alternating growth habit on the stolons or the leaves are alternate instead of opposite. We'll look at St. Augustine here shortly. It'll be opposite. So as you go along that stolen, there will be a leaf that comes out on the top hand side in that picture. And then as you go further along, the next one will come out on the, up to the bottom side of that stolen. So it just kind of, it goes alternating on each side. So that's one, 
one easy way to identify uh, centipede as opposed to St. Augustine, which is our next one. This one is the most shade tolerant of all of our grasses that we have available to us. Um, that doesn't mean it's gonna handle full shade underneath a 200 year old live oak that's got limbs hanging down to the ground and, um, you know, but with a little bit of filtered sun and uh, about three, about three to four hours of daylight is kind of the minimum um, amount that it needs. And like I said, filtered sunlight can't does kind of count through that. Um, so there, and obviously there will be some management things that you'll want to do a little bit differently in instances where it's grown in a lot of shade. Just basically those leaves act as solar panels. So it, the bigger you can have that solar panel, the more, the taller you can leave it and still be comfortable with it and not feel bad about it. Um, the more sunlight it's going to be able to to intercept. So um, leaving at a tall, mowing at a taller um, mow height is definitely recommended. Watering a little bit less in a shade instance because it's not going to obviously grow as much and need as much water and it's not going to be evaporate quite as fast. So you don't want to cause disease issues by overwatering in a shade instance. The leaves of St. Augustine are very coarse. You can see here on this picture, um, this is very indicative of St. Augustine. It has a big wide blade. Um, you know, it's not a fine textured grass like Bermuda by any stretch of the imagination. Um, the seed head you can see here on the right picture is kind of like a centipede grass, it's kind of just a single stalk. It doesn't ha have any um, any type of um, little awns or anything that come off of the end of the seed head. So the seeds are attached directly to uh, the stalk. But um, you can see in this picture here with the knife how the leaves in St. Augustine grass are opposite instead of um, alternating instead like the centipede grass. There's a piece of, of the stolen and then as you come up there's a leaf on going both left and right hand side. Empty piece of stolen and then again left and right hand side leaves. So um, poor cold tolerance. Typically we don't recommend this typically north of Highway 82. Um, Kind of as a kind of a cutoff. Some say 20, some say 82, but I've seen it do pretty good um, in that 20 to eight, Interstate 20 to Highway 82 up around Greenwood over the Startful area. It does kind of fine there, um, but it does have poor cold tolerance. So an extreme weather event in the winter can cause some winter kill. Uh, it is very insect and disease susceptible. So if you're Soil is not done right, your pH isn't right, it doesn't have the proper nutrition, you can run into some issues with insects and diseases. Um, there are no viable seeds typically, so you're not you're only going to be able to establish it vegetatively, and it has extremely poor traffic tolerance. This may be even worse than, um, than centipede. Um, we'll get into sitting. I'm looking at the, um, the, the chat over here. Uh, how large of an area would one pound of centipede grass seed cover? We'll get in, look at seeding rates here in just a second, but I think like four ounces of seed is per, per thousand square feet. So you're looking at 4,000 square feet, basically per pound of seed. So not very much. You're looking at basically a tenth of an acre per pound. So uh, basically 10 to 12 pounds per acre is kind of, um, but Christian just answered that. I'm sorry. He beat me to it. I apologize for that. But um, so a smaller area, smaller lawn, this is something that you'll want to, would may want to look into or even, you know, possibly doing small sections and then encouraging it, doing kind of as plugging it or uh, kind of doing some spaces as far as bare ground and then letting it kind of creep into those areas to uh, if you're trying to do a larger area at one time. Hopefully that makes sense. All right, so then our next one is Bahia grass. Uh, this is kind of South Mississippi's default lawn just because of basically 
at one time, most all of this was a pasture or forage at one time. And we just kind of went in there into those pastures and bulldozed them out, smoothed them out, built a house in there, threw some sod on top, and there were still some seed or some rhizomes or stolons or something left into the area. So um, it reverts back to bahia grass, or you start having some issues with bahia grass uh, popping up in your home lawn. So it is a poor choice for lawns, but a lot of times we were just kind of, that's what we're stuck with. Um, that's just, just part of it. Uh, it creates a low density turf. Uh, got a chat here, question, can you lay St. Augustine like patchwork or plugs? Yes, definitely can. Um, obviously you'll want to do a little bit of weed control and it's going to take a little bit. St. Augustine's kind of a slow grower, so it's going to take a little while, but you can do it. Um, you know, you may want to put your plugs a little bit closer together. We say basically a foot apart. So, you know, it will work. You're just going to have to do some, do some weed control and do some, make sure it has plenty of moisture and it's going to be hard to keep that bare ground in between moist um, or, you know, sufficient moisture there for it to kind of get in, but it can be done. So, but back to the bahia grass, it does have a tremendous seed head problem. As anybody who has bahia grass knows that you mow it today and two days later you come out and you've got a seed head sticking up. Uh, so a lot of instances this is considered a weed. Uh, it does make a good pasture or forage grass. So because of that um, fast growing, uh, tolerates a wide range of soil conditions. Um, and it recovers very well from being um, clipped by a cow or a horse or some other type of uh, livestock animal. So it is a great option for South Mississippi pastures. Um, and you can see here this picture of the leaves in there, how thin the canopy is on there. It's not a very pleasant grass to walk on. Um, you can see that rhizome there with the purple coloration, how they're kind of like a bunch together, like kind of like a group of onions, how the onions, bunch of onions grow. Um, so it's not very comfortable to walk on. Um, and you can see the seed head in both the bottom right picture and the, there's a seed head laying in the middle of that picture on the left. Uh, it's basically identified by the seed head looks like a peace sign sticking up on the end of a stalk. So that's one easy way to identify the bahia grasses with that, through that seed head. Um, also, another one is that purple coloration down at the bottom of where the growing point is for that bahia grass rhizome. Uh, that's a very good, very good identification technique. So, seed bed prep. Um, basically, you just want a, once you decide what type of lawn you're wanting to, um, wanting to establish, um, basically, it's just like a garden. You, maybe not quite as fine of um, tillage, or but you do want a good firm seed bed, um, something that where the seeds can make good seed to soil contact. Or even if you're doing sod, you want good base layer to soil contact, where that thing can the the sod can root into the bare mineral soil uh, or topsoil. You don't want you know you don't want to powdery to where it's out there dusty super fine and where you um you know you just want it to be a nice solid firm seed bed so as i mentioned earlier um the seeding rates you can see here bermuda grass um, and bahia grass typically or and carpet grass even i didn't mention carpet grass um it's not really planted all that much as a permanent lawn, it's kind of something that comes in as a weed or it something that we're kind of stuck with um, because a lot of times centipede and carpet grass are, were, used to be recommended to be seeded, or not recommended, but used to be seeded together in the establishment or when they established these subdivisions because of what I said earlier, how centipede was extremely expensive and so what they would do is they would, and the longer germination time, um, that they would 
put in some centipede seed and mix in some carpet grass to get that quick cover with carpet grass. They do look kind of similar. They kind of have the same growth habit, kind of that same limish green, yellowy green color. So they kind of like the same, basically the same environment. So they kind of do well in a lower pH soil. So they would save some money. Carpet grass seed was a lot cheaper or is a lot cheaper. So they would get a quick cover and then there would be some centipede in there. And then eventually, unfortunately, a lot of times that carpet grass would just take over. Um, but a lot of times you can, there still is some centipede in a lot of places at carpet grass. Now, one way to identify carpet grass um, is the seed head. The easiest way, as I said, Bahia grass has a peace sign. Carpet grass is gonna be a peace sign with a thumb. So if you just hold your peace sign up on your hand and do uh, stick your thumb out, there will be another little uh, seed stalk coming off the main, um, the main seed head. Um, and that's an easy way to, uh, to recognize carpet grass. So um, the seeding rates you can see here, um, obviously, we've mentioned earlier centipede, four to six ounces uh, per thousand square feet. Um, Bermuda grass, half a pound to a pound. Um, obviously, you can read this. Um, but uh, one thing I wanted to mention earlier, uh, most all of this information is found in our uh, Establish Your Lawn and um, Establish and Maintain Your Home Lawn publication. I think it's P1322 on our website. Um, we do have those available in our offices as well. Um, but I'll, at the end of the discussion here, I'll show y'all how to find it on our website and how to easily navigate straight to it. So, so now here's one thing that I see a lot of problems with. Uh, this is where a lot of people run into issues. They, um, they're not mowing their grass at the right height. A or B, they're not doing that one third rule, which is mentioned up at the top. So basically the one third rule means you never want to mow off one third of the plant or the turf at any one time. So if you're let, if just say we got a centipede grass lawn and we want to mow it at, uh, at two inches, we don't need to let it get up to five inches and then mow it down to two inches. That's, that's mowing off more than one third of the leaf at one time. So we don't really want to let that, if we're maintaining it at two inches, we don't really want to let it get over about three inches before we mow it to begin with. So uh, these are the correct heights that, um, that you would like, that we'd like to see you mow your grass at. This is where they're going to do their best. This is where they're going to be able to be the healthiest and fend off the most issues, most problems that you could have. Um, obviously, St. Augustine is the one that is probably I see done wrong the most. I see a lot of people that like to have that St. Augustine grass, yet they cut all those solar panels off. Um, they chop, they scalp it down and it just, it, it doesn't like that very much. It doesn't like it at all. Um, you can see there's a two and a half to three inches and even two and a half to me is almost a little too short on St. Augustine grass. So, um, and in instances where you're growing it in full shade or heavy shade, um, you'll even want to let it get up more than the three. Uh, so that's just something to think about. So that's one thing I was telling you, if you can allow those solar panels to get up a little bit higher, a little bit bigger in those instances, it's a good option for you and it's going to let it do a little bit better in those, those kind of tougher to grow instances. But again, don't mow off more than one third at any one time. So if you do have to let it get up to five inches because of some rain or wet conditions or something, slowly, um, slowly get it back down. You know, don't go from five to two, go from five to about four or four and a, three and a half to four and then drop it, come back a couple of days later, give it a little time to recover and then come back and then you can get it down to, down, back down to your two typically. Um, thank you, Jessica, for shooting that, uh, that link to the, to the uh, Establish and Manage Your Home Loan publication in the chat. 
uh, that is a great, great resource. And most, and all of this information can come, will, is contained in that. So um, it is a very thorough publication. Uh, it kind of walks you through this, through a, most everything that I'm gonna cover through this series for the most part. But again, we're here to ask questions and if you have anything, don't hesitate to let us know. So, um, Watering, this is another big thing I see a lot of questions and a lot of issues with. Um, this is something that um, a lot of people have an irrigation system. Uh, a lot of people don't, but some do. And a lot of people that have it, they don't know how to work it correctly or don't know how to program it or don't know, or they're just kind of one of those where, oh, well, the person that put it, once it gets put in, they leave it however it is. Um, they don't, you know, they don't go in and fool with it or if it, you know, I, a lot of times, especially a lot of commercial instances, you'll ride by Dollar General or something and it'll be raining and it'll be December raining currently and their irrigation system will be on. Uh, they're out there watering. So it's just one of those things where a lot of times people just don't think about it and they just let it go. Well, it's been working for years and you know that's just something that they don't, don't, don't look into very much. But, Typically, we like to see turfs about one to one and a half inches of water per week. So if you can irrigate, obviously, if you don't have an irrigation system, that's not a, you know, not a, not something that you can control very much of other than dragging a hose out and hooking up a sprinkler to the end of it and moving it around the yard. But uh, a good way to measure this one to one and a half inches per week to see what you're putting out either with an irrigation system or just through a sprinkler system that you're moving around the house, moving around the, the lawn. Um, get you some little cat, wet fat cat food cans or tuna cans or something like that. Those are typically one inch deep or right around one inches. So the little metal cans to cut the tops off out of them, um, obviously, hopefully eat the tuna or whatever it is and put those around your lawn kind of in in the area where you're curious about or if you are using one of the irrigation or one of the sprinklers uh, put those out to where the irrigation is getting in them and then you can base how much water you're putting out or how long it took you to put an inch of water out um, and then you can if it takes say 30 minutes to put out half an inch of water you know you need to run that in that area for two times a week and basically for 30 minutes if it takes you 30 minutes so after 30 minutes move it to another spot so that'll that'll give you a good basis as to how much water you're putting out at any one time um, obviously we like to recommend deep and infrequent so watering so basically you don't want to put a tenth of an inch every day uh, put your if your soil can handle a full one inch at one watering Give it all a full one inch. Uh, obviously on a sandy soil, it's gonna take a probably a little bit more than that. On a clay soil, you're not gonna be able, heavy clay soil, you're not gonna be able to put out all that out at one time just because it's all gonna puddle up and run down the drain or run down the curb into the drainage ditch. So, um, you know, based off of your soil properties, keep an eye on it. Once you start seeing water puddling up, move it to a new area or, um, you know, Cut it off for a little while, let that move, saturate, move down, percolate through the soil, um, and then come back and do your other little bit in a day or two or however long, you know, whatever works best for you. So uh, let the grass kind of tell you when it needs water. Don't just think, oh, well, you know, I ain't watered it in a week. Now, if it's still green, it don't need any water. It, it'll turn kind of a bluish, grayish color, and when you walk on it, it'll kind of crunchy sounding and it'll, it'll leave ghost footprints in it when it gets dry. So let your grass tell you when it needs water. Um, overwatering can cause just as much issues as, if not more issues than overwatering. Um, because A, you're saturating that soil, you're taking out all those air spaces in the soil that the roots need to breathe. Um, so you're basically drowning your roots. Um, and then you're not only that, but you're creating a havoc for uh, creating the ideal conditions for diseases, which we'll get into at a later presentation. But um, obviously that's one leg of the disease triangle is um, environment. So that's one way we can um, basically 
control our environment is by controlling the moisture because moist diseases need moisture to, to live. So we can limit that amount of moisture, we're we'll be in a lot better shape. I uh, got a question. Would fescues be one of the best grasses for North Mississippi slope site, mostly shaded, poor soil? Yes, fescues, uh, depending on the year, I can't, you know, fescues do a lot better up there. I don't have a lot of experience with fescues, unfortunately. Uh, most of all of my turf work has been in south on the Gulf Coast region area, uh, but fescues do well in shade um, and poor soil. Um, they're relatively, you know, in very, very hot instances, they will, you'll, you'll run into some issues or some die back in on the fescues. But yes, fescues would, would be a viable option in that, in that instance. Hope that kind of, I know that wasn't a direct answer, but it's, it is a, definitely a good option. So this is an indicator of improper mowing frequency. As I mentioned earlier, this is, causes more problems than, than, you, um, than you can imagine. Um, a, it gives, it creates shade issues for the grass underneath the clumps. B, it creates disease issues because of it's retaining moisture underneath those clumps. Uh, C, it's inviting insects. So you're kind of creating a whirlwind of problems by doing this. And see, you just more than likely violated the one third rule. So now your grass is stressed out and you've got all these in invaders trying to come in, diseases and insects, um, and they're gonna be very susceptible to these issues, your turf is. So um, try to avoid this at all costs. Obviously, you know, you gotta do what you gotta do, but again, try to avoid it. Um, the best, best, best way you can. So, um, something that looks gets overlooked a lot of times is during mowing is going to be um, blade sharpening. Make sure you sharpen your blade at least once or twice a year. Typically, the winter time is a good time to change out those blades, take them off, inspect them, make sure they're sharpened. And only sharpen the top side of the blade. Don't do you don't notice when you look at lawnmower blades how the cutting edges or the sharpened edges or the bottom edge of the of the blade is flat, and then there's a ground down edge to that area. If you start grinding on both sides of that blade, you're going to change up your mowing height, uh, and you're going to have uneven mowing. You're never going to be ever to get your mower back level for the most part. So it's gonna look, leave gouges in the ground or high spots or something, depending on how you sharpen it. So uh, a lot of times we run through ant beds and stuff with our mowers and that's basically just taking your knife and sticking it down through beach sand or sand and then trying to come up and cut a piece of wet toilet paper with it or something. It just, it rips it, it doesn't cut it. So a good sharp blade will go a world in helping that grass look better, um, helping it recover better from mowing and help it seal off those ends to where diseases and insects can't, it can't attack the, the damaged end of that blade of grass um, and while it heals up. A couple of questions, how often do you need to aerate? Um, typically once a year. Um, obviously in some areas that may be depending on your traffic, uh, depending on your soil type. Um, clay soil, obviously you'll want to aerate a little more often. Um, sandy soil, you may not need to aerate as much, quite as much. There's really no one textbook answer to that question. If you do a lot of driving on it or a lot of playground, like a playground that gets a lot of traffic from people walking on it. Um, that will require more aeration. A good way to judge whether you need aeration or not, um, on a good day where there's decent soil moisture, it's not in a significant drought or it didn't just rain three inches, take you an old serrated uh, steak knife, just an old cheap serrated steak knife, not a butter knife or anything like that, but you should be able to typically push that in with just your thumb. You shouldn't have to get a hammer to drive it down into the ground a couple of inches. 
But if you can just take that knife, that, that kind of serrated steak knife and push it down into the ground with just your thumb, you should be able to, you know, you sh that should be a good indicator of whether or not you need to aerate or not. If you have to get a sledgehammer out to beat it down into the ground, you probably need aerification. Um, so that's just one way to kind of judge whether or not you need it or not. Um, do I recommend leaving cuttings on grass? Yes, that is free fertilizer. Um, definitely leave it on there. Uh, unless you're in this instance where, like this that I've on the screen here, you can see, don't leave that on there. You'll want to like break that up or blow it off or distribute it somehow to where there's not big clumps and, you know, things like that on there, as I mentioned earlier, is all the things that that, that causes all the issues. So, um, let's see, watering, we talked about some excess water issue, some causes, excess rainfall, excessive irrigation, just a high water table or even flooding can cause issues. So the effects that we see from um, excess water, obviously, as I mentioned earlier, you're saturating that soil, you're removing that soil oxygen, um, the root mass and depth, the water, the roots don't have to hunt. That's why I was saying don't irrigate a tenth of an inch at a time because if you just keep that top tenth of an inch wet, the roots, it doesn't need to root down. It doesn't need to send roots down three inches because all the water's at a tenth of an inch. So issues with that are you're gonna have people, or you're gonna have issues during a drought time, it's not gonna be able to handle that drought because it doesn't have a well-established deep root system. Uh, and then obviously we can have some, create some surface drainage issues and some rutting and things like that when with the excess water. Um, Another question over here. I know I'm kind of going over time. I try to like to keep these about an hour or so, a little bit less. So I do appreciate it. I'm gonna try to get to everybody. I'll, I'll be here as long as we need to be. But um, what mechanisms prevent the total uptake of nutrients when the soil pH is below 5.5? Um, is it biological change in CEC? Other reason. Um, basically, it's just a. Um, the, it's the CEC, basic, for somewhat. Um, it, those nutrients become tied up to the soil particles, um, and the soil particles are not, are, aren't able to uh, release those nutrients. Basically, they're holding on to them tighter than the roots are able to get them. So, um, you know, we recommend anywhere from six to six and a half being your kind of the ideal pH for most turf grasses. Centipede can handle down around the five-ish mark. I've seen, you know, seen it growing in 4.7s, 4.8s, somewhere around in there. So, but obviously those are your lower nutrient requirement grasses. So even though those nutrients are tied up, the grasses don't need them as much. So your Bermuda grass, your zoysia, your St. Augustine, those are going to require more nutrients and they will obviously will need them more. So the higher the C's or the higher the pH, the more those nutrients are available. Hopefully that kind of answered your question. So nutrition, basically you got to figure out why you're fertilizing, um, whether you're establishing it, whether you just want the color, you want some recovery, um, or you want it to grow. It's not really doing what you want it to do. So these are all good reasons, but you need to figure out why you're doing it and plan accordingly. So again, soil test, uh, that's gonna tell you what nutrients you need or where, you, where you're at. Uh, and this is a chart here from our publication, um, directly from it actually. And this is just kind of a basis of what the grasses need without doing a soil test. Now obviously, you know, a lot of instances, this is just ratio. So obviously 312 potash, three pounds of nitrogen, one pound of potash or phosphate and two pounds of potash for hybrid Bermuda grass in zone 7A. These are our zones in South Mississippi. Um, so this just kind of gives you a rough estimate of how much to put out, the number of applications, and then the time on the far right, the dates of kind of the rough estimate of dates. It don't have to be on those exact dates, but again, 
as expensive as fertilizer is, I would spend eight dollars on the soil test and get it. Just have a soil test done, and you know exactly what you have, exactly what you need, and how to make up that deficiency. So I can, again, I can tell you, just like this chart can tell you what the grass needs, but we don't know what you already have. So spend that eight dollars on, you know, if it just saves you a bag of fertilizer, that's basically just saved you ten dollars because eight dollars of the soil test versus the 15 to 18 dollars for the bag of fertilizer just saved you so um again just based off of that last thing you can see centipede grass don't require much of anything so again how much you fertilize is going to depend on how much you need it to uh, obviously sports fields and golf courses they fertilize a lot because they need the recovery they need the traffic tolerance they need the, the greenness more so than a home lawn does. So again, down at the bottom, anywhere from a tenth to a quarter of a pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet per centipede is all it needs. Um, and then I always like to say, as this down here at the bottom says, treat it like Bermuda grass and before long you're gonna be growing Bermuda grass. Uh, not necessarily that your centipede is gonna turn into Bermuda grass, but if there's any Bermuda grass there, you're creating ideal conditions for that Bermuda grass and it's gonna thrive. So a lot of times people call me, well, I've got every kind of grass known to man in my yard. And you know, that's one thing we have to do is we have to figure out which one is gonna do better in that instance and which one they prefer. So um, when you're troubleshooting, look up, look down. Uh, most of the problems are gonna either be light problems, the lack of sunlight, or going to be some type of thatch, drainage, or pest or compaction. So a lot of times it's not nutrient related. There's some other type of concern with the soil. Um, but it, a lot, sometimes it can be remedied by nutrients. So that's basically all I've got today. Again, I know I went a little long. Um, again, check out this P1322, uh, Establish and Manage Your Home Loan. Um, and I'm going to show you, I think I'm, hopefully you're seeing what I'm seeing here, my, the website. Um, just go to extension.msstate.edu. Um, and then in the top right-hand corner, you'll see that search extension. If you'll just put home loan in there, hit enter, search. First thing that comes up, establish and manage your home loan. So that, that's a quick way to navigate this website and find anything basically whether it be apples and pears and peaches or fruit or you know whatever you're interested in that's a great way to navigate that website so with that being said I am going to end it there um, I know again I appreciate y'all all sticking with me for that amount of time and um, I'm open to any questions from here on out and again this will be a series so I'll delve into some weed ID, weed control, insect ID control in future 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 um, presentations. So, but I'll be more than happy to answer personal, you know, whether it be something going on currently with your lawn or whatever, I'll be happy to stick around for a little while and talk to you individually if necessary. So thank y'all again and thank you, Dr. Stevenson, for inviting me here today.